the first time I saw this kid play for Ohio State, it was a wow moment. With the 15th pick, the Pittsburgh Steelers select Ryan Shazier, mm. linebacker, Ohio State. Emmanuel now has a pocket, throws down the field. Ryan Shazier picks it up. And number 50 is at midfield to the 40 to the 37 yard line. Ryan Shazier is putting on a rinse. 27 yards on the return. He has been as advertised. When Shazier's out there, it's a whole nother ball game. Fires it over the middle. The pass is caught. That's going to be a three yard gain to the 17. And a Steeler is down on the play. It's Ryan Shazier. There was a typical tackle. I made that tackle thousands of times. But in that instant, I ended up fracturing some vertebrae in my back and caused me to have a spinal cord injury. Don't cut it a comeback. Hi and hello and welcome to Don't Call It a Comeback. We've got a special one today. The subject is Ryan Shazier. Yeah, that's right. We're going to break format today. And you are the person we are talking about. Your tremendous comeback story. Sound good to you, 5 Sound good to me. All right, let's do it. We're going to go back to your early days. Your big success with the Buckeyes, then with the Pittsburgh Steelers, your, your injury, and then your triumphant heroic comeback from Wondery. I'm Dave Damashek. And I'm Ryan Shazier. This is Don't Call It A Comeback. Don't call it a comeback. I've been waiting on this moment my whole life. You can't call it a comeback. Everybody see your feet, make arenas ride. Yeah, I'm saying from the left to right, we get it on tonight. We do it all, but we don't back down. Just give me one shot, one chance, I'ma take it. Fixing up the game, but these records I keep on breaking. Break it. All right, 5 we're featuring your remarkable comeback story this week in hopes that it inspires some others to mount a comeback of their own this coming year. To do that, I think we have to go all the way back, start at the beginning of your life, work all the way through the lowest points you ever faced, and hear the climb that gets you sitting here next to me. Wonderful for me, at least. I hope you agree that it's wonderful to join me right here, right? I think I think it's all right. All right. High point? High point? I, I would say medium. Okay. Medium okay. point. And I'll mess okay. with you. I'm dude. glad, I'm, 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 glad I'm not at the bottom <laughs> of the barrel. Okay. So let's start off. You're in South Florida. Um and that's obviously where you grow up. Where do you recall first um, vibing to the game of football? I would say when I was around five years old, my father, he was a football coach for a school called Blanchili High School. He's in Pompano Beach. Um, Patrick uh, Peterson went to that school. I actually played uh, one year with him. And I just love the game since I was about five years old. I, I used to play football all the time. I had ESPN and Sports Center just running on my TV as if it was a dentist's office. I, I I just love football. I used to watch it all the time. I loved everything about the game. I just, even to this day, I still love football. Well, I love football at an early age too, but no one ever indicated to me that I should play football and aspire to doing it at a high level. When did you first sense or did somebody come to you and tell you you're special as an athlete, you have a future in this? So when I was around high school, uh, people were saying, hey, Ryan, you're pretty good. Um, in Florida, there's a lot of good players because of Little League and just all the competitive football down there. So I, I knew I was pretty good, but once I started getting offers from big-time colleges, that's when I knew that I was a player that made a lot of noise, a, a player that a lot of people had to respect. And once I started getting those offers, it really made me feel confident, and I just started getting more confidence after that. Actually, let's go back a minute here and say – uh, and talk about the physical challenge you had to deal with early in life, scoliosis. What's that like to even get out onto the field with that? So the thing that's crazy with the scoliosis is uh, when I, if you don't really have any problems, you, you feel like a regular kid. You just your back is just it has a, a small curve in it. Then I end up finding out I had a pretty large curve in my back. So my back wasn't I wasn't in any pain. I wasn't struggling or anything like that. It was just more about my back and the doctor was saying the way your back is if you have any like serious hits your back bones are more vulnerable to fractures or more likely to get hurt and when me having scoliosis they almost ruled me out of playing football so mm -hmm. it, it really made it difficult when i was in high school because once i as a sophomore i was just starting to get college attention and then the, they told me hey ryan you have you have scoliosis, you might not be able to play football. So that was a very tough moment for me. Did you have to do anything to, you know, get prepared to be on the field? Any special 
sort of, uh, you know, I, I know you had to sleep upright at one point, yeah. right? Yeah, so I had to sleep upright. I had a, a brace on that I wore 24-7, so it would be underneath my clothes that I wear Oh, school. man. It was a yellow brace that I wore that was a hardened brace that made me sleep a certain way, so it always kept my my posture upright. So it was definitely uncomfortable wearing that wearing that stuff, but it definitely helped me control my curvature and it and it allowed me to be able to play football. What do you mean you had to sleep upright though? I can't visually imagine it. I mean you're standing up or you So basically sat on a bed or what? So it was basically I would have a brace on that was hardened. So imagine a brace that kinda like made you turn this way mm-hmm. and uh, you can lay in it but with I'm turned kind of like a, a C almost. And when you're laying like that, it doesn't really feel that comfortable. So I would just put my, my pillows behind me in my bed and I would just have my legs flat and just sleep up right with my back on the wall. Yeah. Hmm. It wasn't comfortable. I wouldn't think, I mean, I can't fall asleep on an airplane. So maybe afterwards you could give me some tips on how to fall asleep in uncomfortable spots like that. But what does that do to your self-esteem then? Because if you're the BMOC because of football, I would imagine you, and you strike me as an, have always struck me as a, as an eminently uh, confident guy in your ability and otherwise. But if you're also dealing with that, does it create a conflicted sense of who you are with your peers in high school and what your future is going to be in terms of football? I don't really feel like it dropped my confidence at all. Hmm. I feel like the biggest moment that kind of dropped a little bit of confidence for me was after I got injured, like my my big injury that I deal hmm. with. But I don't feel like that made me stop any confidence at all because I was playing football. I was completely fine. There was nothing. I feel like it was nothing wrong with me. Obviously, this doctor had diagnosed me with something, but I was like, I'm fine. It's, I'm, I'm not currently injured. So I just was trying to prove the doctor wrong and just do what you said, but also prove him that, hey, I can still play football at a high level. So you start getting, like we say, you know, all the all the big brand names are after you, Florida State, LSU, USC, and otherwise. Um, what's that like as a, you know, as a high school kid? I know you don't have something to compare it to, but normal people are not getting heavily recruited by the the football teams that are playing on Saturdays on national TV. Did you feel different than your peers? Or you mentioned, obviously, Florida is a hotbed for for football talent. Were a bunch of your pals also going through the same thing, also getting those letters? Or did you really stand out? Uh, I, I would definitely say I stood out. I had friends that were getting letters, but they were from smaller schools. And the biggest thing that I would say is I'm not a very cocky guy, but I would say I'm a very confident guy. Mm-hmm. So I never really try to rub it in people's faces like, hey, I got this offer, I got that offer. I would, if I told somebody it was more out of excitement of what I what was happening in my life. But I would say the biggest thing that I could tell in that situation was that a lot of guys that played on my team sometimes were happy for me. I had probably 50% happy and 50% that envied me. And the reason I would say is because if you're getting all those offers, you're already one of the better guys on the team. But, you know, people always find a way to make an excuse why you got something and they did it. Mm-hmm. I remember Elon Musk tweeted something. He said, I work 17 hours a day for seven days a week for uh, seven days a week for 365 days a year. And people still call me lucky. You know, and that's kind of the same situation where I felt I worked really hard. Uh, I studied a lot. I might have not. I'm going to be completely honest. I was I probably in high school. I might have not been the hardest worker. By the time I got to the NFL, I was one of the hardest workers. Mm. But by, when I was in high school, I wouldn't say I was the hardest worker. I definitely worked hard, but I had people on my team that I would say that worked a little bit harder than me, and they ended up going to college as well. But I was athletically gifted, so I worked hard, and I had a little bit of my athletic ability. But once I started to get to college, I understood I needed to work a little bit harder because there are guys that's just as athletic as me. And that college was, of course, the Ohio State University. Why there? Among all the places that were recruiting you, you had some deep south places. You're a Florida guy. Why didn't you stay down there where it's nice and warm? Why head up to Columbus, Ohio, of all places? So I was committed to the University of Florida for about two years when Coach Meyer was there. And when I was committed there, he ended up resigning with two weeks for me to decide what college I was going to go to. So I visited Ohio State and I visited LSU. And when I visit both of those schools, I actually had a better visit, like just more fun and just just college atmosphere, just making it like a party. Uh, it was a better time at LSU 
But when I went to just see what's better for my life and what was a better outcome and what was the better school at the time and just I just looking at a long term vision of Ohio State was a better vision for me. So the reason I ended up going to Ohio State instead of a, a Florida, one of the main reasons is because Urban Meyer resigned. If you resign probably a year later, I'll probably be in a gator. Hmm. You know, and but the thing is, a uh, guy makes things happen for a reason, and I truly believe that because Urban Meyer ended up resigning and then ended up being my coach two years later. Um, but any thought, any concern about legitimately? Because I talk to a lot of guys who say, "Man, I really don't like it when it gets to be December and January, and it gets chilly in the AFC North, and otherwise you're in the Big Ten. That, I mean, as a Florida kid, where you kind of like, I don't want to be out in the cold. So me and my dad, we had thought about this and we said, hey, Ryan, if you're good enough to make it to the NFL, because everybody thinks they're good enough to make it to the NFL when you're getting recruited. But if you're good enough to make it to the NFL, you're going to have to play in cold games eventually. So with me going to Ohio State, I felt like it prepared me a lot more than if I went to the University of Florida, University of Miami, or USC, because I've had teammates that went to those schools and when the winter months come, all I hear is nothing but complaining. And Coach Tomlin said, uh, don't, he said, don't complain. And the reason he said why, because it's either people happy that you're complaining, people happy you have problems, or people don't care that you have those problems. Well, you go up there, Big Ten superstar, you play for multiple coaches, like you say, and you thrived under all of them. Pulls it down to run and gets leveled by Shazier. His own end zone, McLean intercepted inside the 20. Shazier touchdown. Now you're a national star on the college level. You decide to skip your senior year with the Buckeyes. What goes into that? Any counsel from family? Was it your personal decision? You uh, met all your goals as a as a student athlete. You were ready for the next level. What gives? One of the biggest things is I definitely have a lot of counsel with my family whenever I make a lot of decisions. But that decision was. I talked to my family a lot about it. And I was like, hey, I think I'm gonna do this. I think I'm gonna do that. But that was kind of my parents like, hey, this is on you. If you wanna stay extra year, you can stay extra year. But if you wanna leave, you can leave. But I told my dad middle way, me after my sophomore year, I said, dad, if I have a year, anything, anything relatively close to this year, I'm leaving. And I, I started to have a good year. I put in my grade and they said, hey, worst case scenario, Ryan's gonna go second round. Hmm. And I was like, if that's the worst case scenario, then that means, I've done everything I could here in Ohio State. And there isn't at that point sort of, uh, you're not working on a backup plan. You are all in that my career is going to be pro football player, right? I feel most people that are great at anything, they don't initially have a backup plan. Most of the time when they're great at something, that's their plan A, and they don't really have a plan B. And then once things with their plan A starts to get fishy, or you have to kind of, or you get fired or you have to do something different, that's when you get a plan B. But whenever you have a plan A, a plan B and a plan C, once you go into plan A, whenever you get a little bit of resistance in plan A, plan B looks a little bit better. Hmm. Well, you were the plan A for one pro football team that resides on the banks of the Three Rivers. I was there that night, Radio City Music Hall. Here's what that sounded like. With the 15th pick, in the oh 2014 God. NFL Draft, the Pittsburgh Steelers select Ryan Shazier, mm. linebacker, Ohio State. Wow. He's one of the fastest linebackers I've ever seen come out of college football. What do you remember about your draft night, aside from talking to me about 20 minutes after your name was called out there? One of the things I remember from my draft night, it was just so crazy because I was one of the top 15 players taken in that draft. So mm -hmm. just to think about this, the players that went ahead of me in my draft were Jadavion Clowney, Aaron Donald, Odell Beckham, Khalil Mack, Jake Matthews. Just, just I haven't heard of those names, yeah. but anyway. Just, just, anyway. just some pretty household names, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to, to the game of football. And to me, I, I knew I was going to be a good player, I knew, but I knew I wasn't going number one overall. And I was like, I'm probably going to get drafted like 14, 15. So the one thing I can really remember from my draft is that I wasn't expecting to go to the Steelers because they already told me that I wasn't going to go there. Who tells you that? 
So Keith Butler, and he jokes around about it all the time. The linebacker coach the linebacker at the time. Coach. Yeah. So I went to visit the uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers in Pittsburgh, and Keith Butler was like, hey, Ryan, you're a fun, phenomenal player. I'm going to be completely honest. I don't know why you're visiting us because I don't think we need a linebacker. Hmm. So I was like, all right, well, if he's saying that, that means I'm probably not coming here. The linebacker coach saying that. So I was like, all right, cool. So I'm probably I'm probably going to get drafted after the Steelers. I, I was like, I'm not going to go. I would love to go top 10, but I was like, I'm probably not going to go top 10. I'm, I, one thing I can say about myself, I feel like I'm very I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm very realistic when it comes to things. If, if if I'm not doing something the right way, I I feel like I'm pretty realistic. Obviously, I, I have very high expectations, but one thing I am is realistic. So I was like, I'm probably not gonna go top ten, but I probably can go like top fifteen later. And I started getting my shoe, uh, put my shoes on, and they told me, hey, the Dallas Cowboys are about to draft you. And I was like, all right, well, I'm about to go to Dallas because I visit there and I talked to Jerry Jones, and it seemed like he really like like me when we were talking. It seemed like it was a great you know a great time, and so I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be a Dallas Cowboys. Then it still called me. And then I'm going to be honest, I couldn't be happier. Well, you must have been thrilled beyond the brand that is the Steelers by the specific guys you were running out there with. They're on the tail end. There's some guys on that defensive side of the ball that are still basking in the glow of those Super Bowls, Troy Palomalu on down and then transitioning into the to the new generation cam hayward one of the constants in that tj watt arriving and so on was that a thrill for you intimidating on any level did you feel like water finds its level this is where i belong with these superstar guys i definitely feel like this is where i belong i, I never go into a situation where i feel like i don't belong here uh, i just i just don't like unless i go to like a a harvard you know Psycho not psychology, like a philosophy meeting or something, then I'm gonna be like, yeah, I don't belong here. Or like a you know, astronomy meeting, I don't belong here. But if but it, when it comes to football, I feel like I was just as good or better than anybody that played the game. Hmm. Like my goal was to be one of the greatest players to play. And I just didn't get to achieve it the way I wanted to. You know, people when I was playing said that at the time, I like the year I got hurt. I was playing as the best linebacker in the NFL, in my opinion, and what other people would say. And to me, I always felt like I was right there with them. So just being able to play with Troy Polamalu, learn from him, learn from Cam Hayward, Ike Taylor's, you know, those guys, uh, James Harrison's, those guys really were just the platform. And to me, it was just like hey, I had to reach reach their level. I had to reach their 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 status. And then when T.J. Watt came in and Cam Hayward, you know, I just really feel that it's just a blessing to play with all those guys because I feel James Harrison, he's on the cusp of being a Hall of Famer. You know, Troy Palomalu is a Hall of Famer. You know, I think T.J. Watt has the possibility to be a Hall of Famer. Well, listen, I'm not going to, like I say, argue with you too much. I think he does wind up with a gold jacket on his back uh, a few years after he hangs it up. But in the meantime... You're in there and you're you are pretty much from day one thriving, which is a little anomalous with the Pittsburgh Steelers. They don't generally put a rookie guy in a big spot there. Does Mike Tomlin, even though surrounded by these big name guys, big personalities, too, we talk about some of those guys on the defensive side with the Steelers in that era. Um, does Mike Tomlin come to you and say you're the linchpin to what I need to do specifically. His defense requires speed at linebacker to make those deep drops to cover things up. Does he indicate that, that to you? Because you're you're an imminently, as I say, you've always struck me as a very quietly confident guy, very matter of fact about like, yeah, I'm good at football. Yeah, you know, you're not bragging about yeah. it at all. But does that hit you as like, wow, I got a lot of weight on my shoulders here? So when I was a rookie, I didn't understand it at first. Because they just literally threw me in the mix. They just threw me in the mix. And I was starting right away. I was calling the plays right away. And I was like, wow, mm. like this is this is not what I expected. I thought I was gonna have to like earn my spot a little bit more. I thought I was gonna have to, you know, just it's gonna take time. And it was like, nope, Ryan, you're a first rounder, you're going in there, you're starting from jumping, and we're gonna need you to help us make plays. So it was a little bit different when, when I first got there, but I really started to understand that Coach Tomlin actually came to me and was like, hey, Ryan, like you are the quarterback and you are the centerpiece of this defense, like basically my third year. Mm. And we, we kind of talked about it and it made me understand what level of football I need to play at. Also, you would go on the field shirtless before games. What gives with that? So I have a story behind that. And the reason I, I wouldn't feel shirtless is because 
one game I was not feeling well. I, I felt like I, I had a uh, flu or a cold or whatever. And when I first started playing, we didn't really wear sleeves and on defense because it was a toughness thing. I don't understand how they consider it tough, but it was a toughness thing. And they said, basically, Ryan, you're not going to be able to wear sleeves this game. And I was like, hey, I'm sick. I, I need to war stay warm. I just don't, I don't feel good. It was a really cold game. And it was like, nope, you got to wear sleeves. I mean, you can't wear sleeves. And James Harrison and the, the captains of the defense was like, hey, we're going to fire you $5,000 per sleeve. And I was like, this makes no sense. So I went to Coach Tomlin, and I was like, hey, like these guys are tripping. He was like, I'll back them up. And I'm like, are you serious? So then basically I said, hey, if I die out here or, you know, if I die out here, it's, it's on you guys. So I was like, I was like, forget it. I'm just going to go out there warm up with no shirt on. It was like 25 degrees and nine mile an hour winds. So – uh, it was just with the wind chill, it was like 18 degrees. And when I ended up playing in the game, after the game, I warmed up with no shirt on. A guy came up to me, was like, hey, like Ryan, you're tripping, man. It was like freezing out there. How you warming up with no shirt off? And then I went to, I was thinking, I'm like, we just played a whole game and that's what you want to talk about? So I was like, oh yeah. If you thought about this this whole game, I have a little bit of an advantage on you because you were thinking about me having no shirt on this whole game and how cold it is. I knew, obviously, I wanted to play this game more than you because that's what's on your mind. So I was like, I have a small competitive advantage. Then I just started doing it from there. Yeah. I love it. Great psych out. You, ne you never follow through with what I counseled you to do. Play a first quarter like that. Then the other team would be completely freaked out with you shirtless out there. I don't but think okay. the NFL will let you do that. I, I, listen, I'm not worried about the rules. Um, okay, so... I think that this is a good place to take a break here. We talk about the fact that you're, you know, a, a college star now transitioning into being a superstar at the highest level. Everything's going great in life. And when we come back, we'll talk about how quickly all of that changes and how you have to basically redefine yourself and, and what the rest of your life's going to be. All right, let's keep on rolling here. You're a Pro Bowl linebacker. You're engaged. You're running around shirtless before pro football games. Everything is right as rain. And you're heading into Monday Night Football in Cincinnati. First of all, are you excited about that? Because like you just touched on, that's been the spot of arguably your greatest game, the wild card game against the same Bengals. And also you're not that far away from Columbus where you were a star, not very many years before that. Where's your mind going into that one? So for the Bengals game, my mind, I was really just thinking about should I play in this game or not? Because I was injured pretty much the whole week. I got injured versus the Green Bay Packers. I, and I hurt my ankle on like the, first, the last play of the game and just – and I, I I wasn't practicing the whole week, and it was a game down decision, and just trying to see if I'll be ready for the game. And then I ended up started playing in the game, and I started off hot. I I had like three or four tackles on the first first series, and uh, I was like, oh, this is gonna be a great game. And then you make the tackle, and you you describe it as a perfect tackle. Is that right? No, I would, I would say it's a tackle that I've done a bunch of times. I wouldn't say it was a perfect tackle because if it was a perfect tackle, I don't think I would have got hit. Or I would have got hurt the way mm -hmm. I did because the one thing I was trying to do was trying to, you know, the NFL is implementing all these new rules to pin your head across and hitting people with your shoulder. So I was intentionally trying to hit somebody with my shoulder, but he was running a little bit faster than I thought. He was on a drag route. And when I lunged to pin my head out, I ended up hitting him in his hip instead of actually hitting him with my shoulder. And my head hit him in the hip, and it caused me to fracture some vertebrae in my back. On second and five, plenty of time for Dalton. They're short of the first down on the catch by the rookie, Josh Malone. And Ryan Shazier, the leader of this Pittsburgh defense, is not getting up. What do you remember then from that moment on? I mean, watching it on TV only, there was there was something to it that, that made me say it, it was different than other injuries almost instantaneously. But obviously how you react in the moment is is more important. The biggest thing I can remember from that moment is once I hit the receiver on that route, my legs just basically, when I hit him, I just dropped immediately. And I just, I couldn't really move. It kind of felt very weird. And 
It, it was just a, a weird feeling. I had like a burning sensation in my back, but it was just a very w- awkward feeling because it was just a, it was a feeling that I never had dealt with before. So you knew it was not a typical. I tweak something. I yeah, I knew something. Bad. I knew something was wrong. I didn't understand how significant it was. I didn't understand how bad it was, but I definitely knew there was something wrong. What are and, and listen, I'm I'm digging in on something that's uh, obviously unpleasant, but. What are what are the trainers the the first guys out there next to you? What are they saying? What's the reaction from no, the teammates just, right just, there? They were just doing all their tests just to see what's going on, see if everything's all right, and you know poking and pricking at me and just seeing everything is all right. And was we asking me when I was getting feeling in certain areas, and when they was asking all those questions, it's just the answer was yeah, I just I, I can't feel that, I can't feel this, I can do this, I can't do that. And you can definitely tell that everybody knew it was kind of a different situation. They haven't really seen something like that before. So it was it was definitely awkward because it was just so many people around me in that moment and and with it being such a big game. Well, I mean, well, you say you say it's a big game. I imagine that transition is tough. I mean, literally in the moment, you're one minute you're focused on stopping the Cincinnati Bengals division foe and suddenly the doctors as you say or the trainers and otherwise are are poking at you trying to figure out what's I mean is your concern level through the roof in that moment or are you kind of like hey let's wrap this up fellas I got to get ready for the second half here so to me I was more focused I didn't I knew the injury was bad but I didn't think it was as bad as it was so I was really just thinking about uh, I, I was just I actually took my mind away from the situation, I was just laying there. I was like, man, obviously I'm hurt for the rest of this game. I'm probably not going to come back in this game. I was mm. like, but with me being hurt this bad, I'm like, I, I got to figure out who's going to pick up my dog that I just bought my wife. Mm. So I was just laying on the field thinking more about, like, I just bought this dog that's supposed to get here tomorrow. Who is going to get my dog? That's what I was thinking about wow. more than, uh, but like when, once I got in the, shuttle and i started asking questions like hey how long you think i'm gonna be out for i know this is kind of like an injury that a lot of people don't deal with a lot like wh- like what are you thinking doc what are you thinking you know they just kept saying like we don't know we don't know we don't know so i actually kind of took my mind off of what was going on at the time and just focused on like my family and was like trying to make sure my wife was happy and trying to get that dog there and then hey i might not ever walk again hmm. and um is anybody with you that you know or are, are, are these a bunch of strangers now taking you? So the doctor the that doctor. was with me was a doctor Okonkwo. He's the team. He's a team neurologist for the Steelers. But he only used to come to one away game a year, and he, that was the one away game that he came to. And it was so crazy because I talked to him before at an Eagles game, and I seen him. And I was like, "Hey, who are you?" And he was like, yeah, "I'm Doctor Okonkwo. I'm a neuro a neurologist." And I was like, "So I'm like, why are you here?" He's like, "I only come to one game a year." Um, but he was like, I'm only for worst case scenarios. You don't want to see me. And I was like, all right, cool. I don't ever plan on seeing you. Mm. And that was the one that was in the car with me and when I was on my way to, to Cincinnati Hospital. So at what point, if at all, that night, do you become aware of the severity of what's going on? Uh, it, it took me a while to actually kind of realize how bad my injury was. It probably took me like almost a week because I was just kind of in denial. I was like, hey, I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better. I'm going to get mm. better. And then I had one day when I was laying in my bed and my god brother was in the room with me. He kind of looked at me. He played at Duquesne. He was looking at me and he was talking to me, but I wasn't feeling well. And I, I wasn't I wasn't feeling good at all. So I ended up throwing up. And in the beds at the hospital, you know, it's like a guardrail, like mm-hmm. a guard thing so you don't fall out of bed. And I end up like this is the wall, and I end up throwing up on the wall, but it smacked me back in my face. Like so, mm. I was so close. Like, I was like this close to it, and I threw up, and hit me back in the face, and I and because I couldn't move away from it. And when that happened, I was saying, "Yeah, I'm I'm in really bad shape. Like I'm in really bad shape, Ryan. Like you can't be." Uh, I was uh, kind of acting naive about how how bad I was. I was, I was just. Almost in disbelief, and then when I when that happened, I was like, "Oh yeah, Ryan, you're you're hurt pretty bad." And then once I once that happened to me, I was like, "Hey, I am not okay. I need to get better, and I need to start focusing on getting better right now." And then from that moment, it's like a light switch. It was like, "I'm going to get better. I'm going to walk again. I'm going to do all this stuff again." But that moment when I threw up in my face, it it kind of was like, "Oh snap! I am hurt." 
way worse than I thought I was. Um, you know, the obviously football is your life, and beyond that, you're a three dimensional human being. But you know, the in the moment resiliency of of football players to just keep on playing and keep on going. I, I happened to be watching that game with uh, your old teammate Ike Taylor, and. In the mall, I, I was like, I, "Who cares about this game? I, you know that the, this this poor kid. You know, this is a. I, I I'm heartbroken for him. What the result is is against the Bengals. Who cares?" And I said, "No, no, Sheck. Coach T is going to have them win this game. That that is not. And you, they were down seventeen. Yeah. Does that mean anything to you? Or are you like, what do I care about a dumb football game? But I feel like knowing you, you probably did care. Yeah, I definitely cared about what this game was going on. Like, I mean, I'm getting a bunch of MRIs and talking to doctors and this and this and that. And I'm in the hospital room, doctors are talking to me. I'm like, can y'all put the game on? Hmm. I'm like, I want to know what the score is. And then there's like, Ryan, like, why are you tripping? Like, you need to focus on this right now. I was like, I need to see if we're winning. Because like I said before, I asked the doctor, I was like, hey, do you think I'll be ready in like three weeks? You know, because I, I, like, I need to get back out there and play on Christmas Day. And so... That just lets you know that I I'm, I love the game of football. I was so focused on the game of football that I was locked in. Well, that was going to be my next question. Are you on any level a week later as this as it starts to progress and you start to accept the reality of things? Do you get mad at football? Do you re, do you resent the game? I don't say I resent it because I one thing I can say is I didn't really cheat the game. I used to work my tail off. I used to study a lot. I used to do everything I can to be the best player I could be. I would. The one thing that I would say I was more frustrated was with guys that were playing a game of football that don't really love football. There's a lot of guys that are really mm. good at a game of football or, or any sport. I know guys that's good at baseball, good at basketball, that don't even like the sport they're playing, but they're just really good at it, so they play it. I was more mad at those guys because I was like, hey, you're, you're not even appreciating the opportunity that you have or appreciating the moment that you have. So I was more frustrated at those guys than, than the game itself. Do you get into then, based on what you just said, then, are you in that why me mode? There are guys who care less than I do. Why couldn't it have been one of them? Or are you, you say, frustrated? Or you're, are you angry? Or are you uh, sad? I wasn't, you know? I wasn't, a, it wasn't a lot of why me. I, I was reading a book at the time. It was called The Obstacle is the Way. So just talking about don't allow the obstacle to change your, the, your way, but allow you to change in your, your obstacle, you know, and, uh, basically, it's like allow the obstacle to become you, basically. And um, one thing that I started really thinking about, and I didn't really ask a lot of why me, because I was just like, I need to take care of what I need to take care of. But if you ask why me, you're basically saying, why not somebody else? Hmm. Um, are you then, as the doctors start to provide you with diagnosis long term, what chances are you given to, to be upright walking around and otherwise? I mean, at what point... Does that become an issue that I may not even, I mean, forget playing football, but, you know, being, to be able to walk around? I remember there was one situation where a doctor told my wife, yeah, Ryan's probably never going to walk again. He's probably going to be less than 20% chance of walking. And she almost cussed that doctor out. Yeah, she was pissed off at the doctor. Hmm. It wasn't a doctor that did my surgery. But Michelle still to this day remembers that doctor's name, knows what she looks like, and is not a fan of her. And she was like, if she see her again, she would be like, I told you so. You know, and but yeah, they did give me less than a twenty percent chance of walking. But I, I can't get mad at that doctor because she's just going off of the stats of the surgeries and the patients that she worked with before. So do you f find yourself in some sort of competitive mode that you would, would have applied to football, but with this, I'm gonna show that doctor who gave me less than twenty percent chance and so on. Is that part of what, uh, you know, lights a fire under you? So, yeah, I, I wouldn't say her per, per, per se, but I would definitely say it, it did light a fire under me. I, I definitely was like, I'm going to walk again. I don't care what nobody says, I'm going to walk again. I'm going to do what I have to do. I'm going to study. I'm going to work out. I'm going to rehab. I'm going to do everything I need to do to walk up and, and try to play football again. And I kind of just went on, and me and my dad had just talked about it, and we set goals, and we just started doing short-term goals. And it was like, hey, Every every little thing that I do, we're gonna call it a first down. Hmm. So every time I did something, I was like, "That's a first down. That's a first down. That's a first down." And I know a lot of people are like, "You play defense. Why you don't say something on the defense side of the ball?" And day football is football, you know. And that day, my goal is to get better. My goal is not to be very uh, specific about how I'm getting better. It was just about trying to get first downs and touchdowns. 
I mean, professional football is not a long term career if you don't go into coaching. Um, so, you know, the shelf life is relatively short, but I mean, yours, yours ends pretty abruptly. And, uh, you know, Jay-Z, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm not a businessman. I'm a businessman is, is kind of all of a sudden that's over for you. Yeah. Um, how do you then start the transition of a new life then? Right. At, at some point you accept, I'm not going to be playing for the Steelers or otherwise. I have to come up with a different way. I feel the the one of the things that's one of the toughest things for a lot of athletes, a lot of people that's not athletes coming out of high school, somebody that might have just recently got fired from their job is just transitioning in general. People just transitioning in general, I feel is extremely hard because most people don't, the best people in transitions are the ones that already know what they want to transition into. And one thing I can say about myself is I was planning on playing football for like 15 years. That was my mm -hmm. goal, unless they just kicked me out. And so when I got hurt, I had to figure out what I wanted to transition into. But I was so focused on football, I didn't know what I wanted to transition to. So it was definitely a tough situation for me. Uh, I definitely took some time to really think about what I wanted to do next and see what was going to be best for my family. But uh, in the transition phase, it was it was definitely something that was not easy for me. It was definitely something that I I was not looking to doing at, at that age. No, I mean, uh, certainly not. Um... Well, I say certainly not. So there was never a time. I mean, football is a contact sport. We know the stories about the dangers. Obviously, the NFL, as you said earlier, is trying to change tackling technique and so on to to prevent these things. Ideally, um, it was never a thought for you, as you say. There was no plan B. Football, fifteen years. So and, yeah, I was definitely football fifteen years, but I I definitely knew that football was short term. So mm -hmm. like the year after I got hurt. I was, the NFL have different programs that you can go to. So I was actually going to go to Warren School of Business. Uh, they had a, a certificate program that you can get an MBA in the off season. So I was actually going to do that, that off season. So, because I understood, I was like, hey, I want to learn more about business. I want to get into business. So that's something that I was looking forward to getting into, but I didn't even get the opportunity to do that yet. So it was just, I, I just, you know, it was not really like I had a plan A and obviously in the off season, just doing little things here or there. That's not really a plan B. It's just mm -hmm. my plan A is just I, I'm just taking a lunch break, you know. And so basically, but I, I, I it, it stopped so fast. Now I have to figure out what I want to do next. And another reason I say uh, people need to have a plan A and stick to it is because I've definitely done so many different things and tried so many different things. And sometimes I notice when I actually put more focus on one or one or two things, I, I have a lot better outcome. So um, amidst all this, you're going through the surgery. You emerge from that. Uh, the doctors continue to inform you what, what the future is going to look like. And all the Steelers are showing up on the sidelines, coaches and otherwise, wearing a 50 T-shirt. A lot of people in Pittsburgh went out and got them as a show of support for you. One, what does that mean? But it all really comes to a head when the Steelers come back against the Ravens to, to clinch the division in a playoff spot, and then they FaceTime you from the locker room. I was there. <laughs> Oh, yay, babe. <laughs> what does that mean to you, the the Steelers, the the city of Pittsburgh, and and specifically that uh, that call from your teammates? No, it it really meant a lot because I was a a key part of that team. I I, was, I helped them be thirteen and three that year, and. So to me, just for us to clinch it and for us to actually win that game and just have those guys call me, have those guys come to my rehab, have those guys just play for me, it really meant a lot for me because it really just showed that they supported me and uh, really uh, enjoyed me as one of their teammates. Well, after the injury, Keith Butler makes this remark. All I am is hopeful that he gets well. I'm not worried about him playing for us again. I'm more, more worried about him. And so uh, I think 
y'all been updated as much as we have. So, you know, the thing that, we, that we're hopeful for, prayerful for, that, that he comes back and he's going to be okay. The football stuff is secondary. Uh, his life is a lot more important to me than football. How does that strike you hearing that from the guy who told you a few years before that you were never going to be a Pittsburgh Steeler in the first place? No, it, it definitely means a lot to me because I know uh, Coach Butler said that he never thought I'd be a Pittsburgh Steeler, but me and him have a great relationship. You know, it was, uh, I think he even said in an interview later that I was like one of his favorite players to coach. You know, so I think to, to me it just – it really means a lot because it just shows you the relationships that coaches and players build when they're, when they're playing because sometimes coaches or people just see players as almost like a robot or just mm-hmm. as somebody that's unhuman. And to me, he played in the NFL. He understands what it's like. And I just really appreciate him just thinking about me like that. Well, some of your teammates, the the main concern for them, again, was not whether or not you were going to be playing football, but how were you going to play with your son, who, as I already mentioned, I it was very clear to anybody who talked to you, um, you know, during that window while you were in the NFL, how much your little boy meant to you. So what did you say to your son? What? The, how did you approach your injury and explain it to him? So he was still very young at that age when I, when I got injured. But I just told him, you know, uh, I, I got injured playing the game of football. And this is something that doesn't really happen to people. It was very unfortunate. But daddy still loved the game of football. And at the end of the day, if there's something that you want to do, I'm going to be here for you. If you want to do something else, I'll be here for you. And no matter what, just because I got hurt, doesn't matter. I'm still the same dad that I'll, I'll always mm. been. So that's kind of the, the message I, I gave him. And you're engaged, like we say, at the time. How does the recovery and otherwise impact uh, your upcoming wedding? So it, it, we definitely pushed our wedding back because I, I told myself I was starting to get a little bit better. But I told myself I didn't want to have a wheelchair in my wedding. And I told myself also I wanted to be able to look back at my pictures and be happy at the pictures that I looked at. And it's nothing wrong with somebody being in a wheelchair, nothing wrong with somebody being crutches. But I just knew that I could get better. And that's one thing that I, I push for every single day. And I was so blessed to be able to marry Michelle. It's obviously a major life change for your immediate family, for your little boy and for Michelle. Um, you know, football player and now it's a very different situation. Do you uh, forgive me for asking personal questions like that, but are there discussions about like, are we still, we still good? We still going to move forward with this? Any you know, I definitely concern a, on that side? I definitely had a conversation with Michelle. I was like, Hey, you know, you're a beautiful woman. You're 25 years old. You have no kids. Cause my, my oldest son is from another lady and, but she's an amazing stepmom. And I, I told her, I was like, Hey, you're 25 years old. At any day, I don't want you to have to be a caregiver for the rest of your life. It's, you know, and I, I deal with caregivers for my foundation. And I know how tough it is as, as a job. And I was like, hey, if, if you want to move on, I be more than you're more than welcome to. Nobody will, nobody would knock you for for leaving. And she was like, Ryan, shut up. And you know, because I, she's like, we're engaged and we're still gonna be here for each other no matter what. Hmm. And that really meant a lot to me. Um, and then on the professional side, Kevin Colbert, the rest of the Steelers organization seems like from the outside looking in, they really, um, rallied around you, but Kevin Colbert really goes the extra mile. It feels like in terms of contract and letting you depart the game on your own terms. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Like what goes into that from what he or anyone else within the organization is saying to you and trying to put you in a spot that makes you comfortable to, to, uh, you know, to kind of declare publicly i'm i'm not going to be playing football one of the things that i really respect and and thank the Steelers a lot for is they said hey ryan we're going to be with you here with you you know until that you feel like you can't play anymore and they gave me two and some they gave me almost two years to try to recover from this injury and Mm -hmm. i'm just truly thankful for that because that that tells me how much they thought of me as a football player but how much they thought of me as a person as well and I showed them my work every day. I, I was there with them all the time, and I, I rehoused with them. And I did everything I possibly could. But then there, then once I said, hey, it's time for me to step away, they said, we completely understand. And then we, you know, uh, and I, I totally understood with them, like, drafting somebody else and, and moving on as well. But I think just – I'm just truly thankful for Kevin and the organization for just even giving me the ability to, to keep fighting. 
All right, we're going to get to the to the good part, the 2018 draft in in Dallas. But um, take me back just real quick to the rehab, which is no small matter. The every day of it, the first six months, the first year, uh, you know, walk me through, if you will, the uh, the worst of it. Uh, the, the biggest thing when it comes to rehab and the worst of it is, I'm going to say, is the definition of insanity. And because the definition of insanity, people always say, is doing the same thing and expecting different results. And that's the definition of spinal cord rehab. You're literally doing the same thing over and 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 over again. And then you expect something else to happen and it doesn't happen. And then you, but the thing is, it slowly but surely starts to, you know, work a little bit better and then better and better. And, you know, now I'm able to walk in here now, but pretty much those first, first month, it felt like insanity. Then the second month, it felt like insanity. Then the third month, you got a little bit better, but it still felt like you're not making progress. And the progress is so small, but it's big. So it's so small that you don't feel it in the moment, but you look down from six months from now, you made huge progress. And that's that's kind of how it, how it goes. Boy, if anything, I mean, that seems to be the message because I imagine that the tedium and concern about is this leading to anything is the message that yeah. people going through anything like that uh, you had to go through need to hear right now. Um, the story, like we say, has a nice chapter with you walking out onto the stage at the 2018 draft. Talk about what you remember from that night. That was a, a, a great night because I remember I talked to Roger Goodell earlier that year and I talked to him about, hey, I think I'll be ready to try to walk in public uh, at the draft. And he's like, hey, if, if that's something that you want to do, we'll let you call it a first round draft pick. So uh, I told my trainer, I was like, hey, I, I told Roger Goodell I'm walking out for the draft. And he was like, what? He was like, I don't know if you're ready yet. And I was like, well, I got to be ready now. So it kind of helped us push a little bit harder in our rehab. And then just to be able to walk on stage with Michelle and call out uh, Terrell and Ms. Pick is something that I would never forget. And I just thank the NFL for allowing me to even be part of that. Please welcome, joined by his fiance Michelle, Ryan Shazier. Yeah, it was a great moment. But are you thinking at that time, Maybe I'll uh, I'll still get the play again. Am I getting it wrong with the timeline to to say that at some point before that you acknowledged I'm probably not going to be? No, that was actually only like six months after the injury, so I definitely thought I would be playing again. Huh. Um, and um, you also get a response that I I mean I remember this pretty well. You were at a Penguins game for the first time publicly since the injury. Ladies and gentlemen, please join the Penguins in extending. Welcome to Pittsburgh Steelers linebacker number 50, Ryan Shazier. We're behind you, Ryan. I remember you. Uh, getting quite a reception from the people wearing black and gold there that night. Yeah, no, that was an amazing experience because that was my first time like standing up in public. Everybody see me in a wheelchair, but I just stood up in public and just kind of like uh, just waved at everybody and just say thank you so much for just supporting me and just just being here for me. The Stiller fans, the Penguins fans, the Pirates fans, ever since I've been in the city have always been embraced me and always treated me with love, and I'm just thankful for it. Um, and – on any level, does the football, the, I mean, the tedium of football practice, does that inform your rehab in um, any way? Are you are you sort of like, I've been through this oh, in yeah. August? That's, and a, that's the one thing about playing sports is just how much practice and just doing things over and over and over again, it causes you to get used to the, that type of rehab. And I was super ready for rehab because I just understood that this is something that I, I – I had to do. This is something that I had to get used to, and this is how life is. So, yeah, I definitely, uh, I definitely was used to that, and and uh, was okay with it by the time I uh, I had to do the rehab. It wasn't fun, but football definitely prepared me. And so now we can jump ahead another year here from the, that draft night, twenty nineteen. You do finally marry Michelle. What the, what stands out to you from that night? Oh man, it was amazing because everything went perfectly on that night. I was able to dance with my wife. A lot of wonderful people were there. 
uh, to celebrate the moment. Mike Tomlin him. said watching you dance yeah. made him weep. Yeah, yeah, and, and he doesn't really weep a lot. Yeah, he's a very strong man. So I just uh, it really mean it really meant a lot because he was there, Mr. Rooney was there, a lot of my good friends were there, and people that really supported me through the whole journey were there. And I just can't thank them enough for just being there for that moment because it was just like a thank you to all the people that were close to me just to be able to walk again. I heard you in another interview um, recently talking about that people come up to you all the time and say, you're an inspiration to us. So now you are an example for that. You are someone who has held up to people who have similar injuries as look at, look at what can happen here. Um, what, what was your response to that? That it's, that's not your favorite no, compliment? I, no, no, no. I, I, I said, uh, I'm very appreciative of it because of the hard work I put in. But I, I noticed that a lot of people say it more often than I would like. And because the thing is, you know, a lot of times people say you're inspirational, but I had to be inspirational because this is, I was fighting for my life. I didn't, I feel like I was fighting for my life. I was, I was fighting for the life that I wanted. And it, it was not by choice. You know, it was, it was because I had to. And to me, so a lot of people, I feel when somebody doesn't know me, they say, oh, you're very inspirational, what you've overcome. It was like, and to me, I think like if you was in the same situation, I would think you would try to do the same, you know? So that's why I say that. But I'm truly, I'm truly thankful because they, they're basically saying, man, I, I love the hard work you put into getting back to where you want to be. Oh, I listen, I don't take, I don't take it wrong. I think I, I, I know what you're getting at, you know, serious illness or injury probably in a way turns you one dimensional to people on the outside looking in and you remain somebody who is a funny guy and yeah. somebody who loves chopping it up, talking about football and, and loves your little boys and Michelle and everything else. That's kind of what you're getting at, mm -hmm. right? Is yeah. that people you want to be treated as you've always been treated basically, yeah. not as something different because of your injury. Is that no, I completely agree. No, that's exactly where I'm kind of coming from with this. It's just I just want to be treated for just the Ryan that everybody knew me before and a good person, a good human being, and somebody that people are like, oh, man, I, I really uh, like spending time with Ryan. I really enjoy Ryan. So it was more – I like more of that than hey, you're inspirational. But and they, they pretty much when they say you're inspirational, you, you overcome something that nobody expected you to do. And now you're doing great things again. And – to me, I just, I think they're just saying like, we appreciate the mm -hmm. work you put in. Well, listen, I've been in proximity to, you know, the illnesses, you know, everybody's experienced that uh, themselves or been close to people who have, and you always, and you say you're, it's, you're not why me about it. What it seems to me is when you're going through that, what you realize is there are a lot of people out there going through this and there's a community out there, but you have a different level of, um, celebrity or, or, or recognition yeah. to, to, to strangers and, and so on. So what message, what, what thought do you have for anyone who's at the front side of going through what you've come through clean and, uh, and built this great life for yourself? The one thing I would just come through with this is just perspective. It is when you're going through something, everybody has to truly has to understand that no matter what you're going through right now, I can go outside and fall off the step and, you know, have another spinal cord injury. You know, right now I can make a phone call and find out some bad news. You know, no matter what you're going through, life, something in life is going to hit you and just depend on what perspective you put into it and how you're going to try to make a change. So the biggest thing for me is just don't regret nothing and really just give you all in pretty much everything you do. And that's, uh, and I feel when you do that, more positive outcomes come than negative ones. Well, uh, the name of your book uh, that's right behind you, hovering over your head there, Walking Miracle, um, you talk about how your um, experience then informs how you, you, you deal with your mom and whatever health issues she may have. Um, and otherwise, and, you know, everybody's in this entire uh, this entire podcast that, that, that we get to do every week together is all about comebacks. So where is your comeback? Complete? Happy ending? More meat on that bone? More room to go? I think there's always more meat on the bone in whatever you do. Like even Michael Jordan, he's still trying to get more meat on his bone. He's trying to win more championships. Mm. And he's the greatest basketball player of all time, depending on who you're talking to. So to me, I think there's definitely more meat on the bone. 
Uh, obviously, I would I would have loved to play football again, but the biggest thing I want to do now is to be able to positive change in people's lives. So as long as I can just uh, help change and help uh, support uh, others, to me, I think that's going to be uh, the comeback that I want. So I just want to be able to help change as many people's lives as I can. Well, I, I, I'm hesitant to say it to you, 5 but you are an inspiration. You are also... <laughs> An all-time icon when you go to the Ohio State University. I've seen you out there with LeBron James and otherwise taking photographs with those guys. You did that. You're, uh, you are you are an icon on the banks of the Three Rivers for all of time. Nothing ever can take that away from you. You wore the black and gold, and you did it proudly and with distinction. And now this new phase of your life, you are an inspiration to people. Like it or not, any final thoughts you want to want to wrap up with here before we say goodbye? Uh, the last thought I would just like to say is, you know, I'm just just thankful. Um, God's blessed me with the opportunity to get back on my feet. You know, uh, I worked a lot, really hard, and it's a it's a, a verse in the Bible that says, "Faith without works is dead." And to me, that's kind of the message I just want to leave with people. You know, having faith in something means a lot, but you have to put the work in if you want to see the outcome. So. That's the biggest thing. Well, I can say you're an inspiration, but uh, I'll say more simply, you're a fun guy to talk with. You uh, you make me laugh every week, and I appreciate you. Fist bump, 5 All right, that's it for, uh, for this episode of Don't Call It a Comeback. Make sure you follow, rate, and review the show wherever you're listening. Also, check us out on YouTube on the Wondery channel, and make sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Peace out. Don't call it a comeback. Been waiting on this moment my whole life. You can't call it a comeback. Everybody to your feet, make arenas ride. Yeah, I'm saying from the left to right, we get it on tonight. We do it all, but we don't back down. Just give me one shot, one chance, I'ma take it. Fixing up the game, but these records I keep on breaking.